So I was thinking to myself at lunchtime, I said, you know, we've spent the morning looking at what's new and innovative. Can't help but notice they brought in some old guy to talk about a 40 year old project. <laughs> anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, this, I'm, I'm going to give you just a tiny bit of history at the beginning of how this project came about, tiny bit. Um, and then basically give you a picture show about the construction of the bridge. So, um, how did Austin get a big arch bridge out on the west side of town? It turns out that uh, originally Loop 360 was envisioned to be a, a two-phase project. The first phase would simply be a two-lane roadway with a conventional bridge across the river. That contract uh, went to letting and Textot said, well, wait a minute. They love the price that they got from the contractor on the or cuts and the excavation um, through these through these hillsides. It's, you know, almost a mountain right there, that one. But um, anyway, they, they asked the contractor if they would consider giving them a similar type of bid price if they were to double the excavation out to the full ultimate width of the, of the 360 project. It's just a shot of some of those, uh, some, particularly the big cut over on the uh, north side of the of the project. About the same time, uh, there was a lot of environmental and aesthetic concerns that were voiced, in particular by the American Institute of Architects here, the local chapter here, um, along with several other uh, people in the general public that had found out about the, what was going on. It's kind of AIA guys got, got a lot of enthusiasm going for getting TxDOT to consider doing something more significant at the, at the site. They enlisted the aid of uh, Travis County Commissioners uh, Ann Richards, who later became the governor, and Bob Haunts, and they went to TxDOT, and TxDOT turns out that the Highway Commission was very supportive of the idea. Let's, let's hold up what we're doing and take a look at this whole thing again. Bridge Vision was asked to study some possibilities for the site. They looked at uh, some uh, options for two 470 foot spans. It would have one pier in the river and then the, so that we could span from embankment to embankment. Segmental concrete was looked at uh, briefly. These were all just quick sort of back of the envelope type of estimates that we looked at. Steel tub girders, uh, a small cable stayed bridge, as well as some arch bridges. Ultimately, a steel arch was selected as the preferred alternative. The arch could completely span the river rather than having a pier in the, in the water. And it turns out that it was, uh, again, the, the rough estimates indicated at a similar cost to those two 470 foot spans. So at that time, the Ridge Vision engaged Mr. Doug Nettleton, who was a retired FHWA arch expert he came and visited with us for a few days. And he taught us a whole lot about arch bridges, how they work, what you know, how the forces are distributed through them, preferred aspect ratios, you know, span to height, you know, member sizes, how to how to support them in various ways. He gave us lots of great information. We looked at bo both tied arches and two hinged arches, but at the same time, all this was happening. I mean, really, exa almost exactly at the same time that 1978 FHWA advisory letter expressed strong concerns about tied arches. The ties were fracture critical and many welding issues were identified. And in fact, if I remember it correctly, there was actually a moratorium that was placed on any new tied arch bridge designs until it could be studied further. It turns out that a two hinged arch worked well at this site anyway, particularly because we had strong limestone foundations available. These were some tied arches that were looked at. Um, the 600 foot span would be a two hinged arch span with uh, four foot by 11 foot deep sections, uh, 13 segments for each rib. I'll just read this off quickly. The wind bracing consisted of large X braces below the deck and Berendil struts above the deck. My old boss, Mr. Bob Reed, many people remember him. He was really excited about the idea of keeping the 
top of the arch uncluttered with, you know, typical K bracing or something like that. Um, 5.7 million pounds of ASTM A588 steel was used, 60,000 one inch and 7 eighths inch A325 side three bolts. And here's the bad news. The fabricator, the contractor decided to go with Hyundai Heavy Industries. Yes, the same people who make cars today, or at least the same corporation out of Ulsan, South Korea. Because this bridge was ultimately funded with 100% state funds, the state could not impose a Buy American clause at that time. So the contractor chose to go to South Korea. The, all the plates for the deal that was fabricated in Korea was were rolled in Japan. Some of the geometry, 87 foot wide deck, four 12 foot lanes that were barrier separated, a six foot sidewalk, uh, 49 foot eye girder spans, seven foot plate girder floor beams were supported by strand hangers. Approach spans uh, on, the, on the north, there was one span of pre-stressed beams on the north and three pre-stressed beam spans on the south. Good old Ashto four beams, does anybody know what those are? Excurters kind of push those off the table. Anyway, the foundations needed to be very substantial. Um, at Vent 2, that we were able to cut directly into the limestone bluff. And in fact, it was all cut by hand. We'll see a couple of shots of that in a second. At Vent 3, there was over 50 foot of soft silt, and I mean really soft material. It covered the limestone, so a different technique had to be used. We'll show a picture in a second. It was decided to use 10 foot diameter drill shafts, which were the largest shafts that had ever been constructed in Texas at the time. I don't mean for you to look at this in any great detail, just to kind of, it just generally depicts, if I can point, I guess not, what the, what the North Bank looked like. It was a single 10 foot diameter shaft like I said, cut into the embankment uh, by hand. On the south bank, we used three 10 foot diameter drill shafts. The first, first one was vertical and the back two were battered. On about 1980, work got started. Started fabricating steel in South Korea and work got going on the approach spans over here on the south. You can also see the crane working on starting to install the uh, foundations for the arch. This is a 10 foot, or this is a cage for a 10 foot diameter drill shaft made up of bundle number 18 bars, pretty substantial. And I just wanted to include this picture. I like the, the picture on, on the right, which is uh, what the contractor came up with. I thought it was innovative. <laughs> They cut, they just, they couldn't figure out what, what are they gonna do for bar chairs? So they made some out of little sections of wide flange beam. Over on the north, the hand cut large diameter hole in the limestone bluff over there. They, they built a sled because they, they, it was gonna be tricky to get that. They wanted to, you know, tie the cage up ahead of time and try to lower it in place rather than trying to tie it in place somehow. But they came up with little skids to put on the bottom of the cage to let it slide down that, that slide. You know, that makes sense. Building the, the north side foundations and even the arch was quite tricky because the big cranes could not reach out far enough to do any serious work down at the bank. However, they, they could get this cage down. It was, it was pretty much the limit of the pick for that, uh, that particular crane. Here it is. He was able to use his tagline to change the angle and ultimately get it pushed down into the hole. I included this picture just to show how the difficulty, the, the, by the way, these were not bundled 18s on this side. This, it was a, a demand was not, the load demand was not needed for that. Anyway, they had to get this concrete poured so it would interface with the, with the cap, you know, member up above. At the same time, the crews were also had a 
started putting barges out in the river and uh, got cranes going to, in, to start building the uh, false work towers. That grillage that you saw or that, that basically was a template designed for uh, piles at each corner and some places along the, the way there, they had little pockets that they could drop steel piling into. I like to tell this story or show this picture just because it was, it was astonishing how soft that material is. The, the operator was able to just let the, let the pile go at the top. The thing, you could hear it slushing its way down through the 50 foot of silt. And when it hit the limestone layer, it, it rang like a big gong. So I just went, oh, this, that's really soft. I could, I could talk about this bridge for about four hours, you know, and tell you other stories about guys sinking up to their waist and the stuff and all that kind of stuff when they drain the river. But anyway, so there was some concerns about that. And they said, no, we're going to, they got the, they got the diesel hammer out and they went ahead and, and hit it several licks to try to, they were basically refusal right at that point. Anyway, I don't think they got much penetration into that, you know, that stone. So this is, they were going to build four false work towers. I mean, arches are tricky to build. There's sometimes they're, bu they're built on false work. Sometimes there's cables that hold the members back until they can make the closure. In this case, four towers were, were the method that the contractor chose. This is one of the small ones, the first one that was built. Just to kind of give you an idea of the, how it was constructed. You can see it's, they brought all this material in. It's paints missing off the various pieces of it and everything it's been used many times before so the steel arrived just about the time the towers were being finished here they are setting the, the enormous shoe that uh, the arch rib bears on on top of that uh, on top of that pier cap with the anchor bolts and the lead sheet underneath it the arch is uh coming the first segment's coming down you can kind of see the curved bearing plate that bears on a 15 inch diameter pin. There's a lot of thrust coming in through there. There's like, if I recall the, the thrust was about 4,500 kips or something like that. An interesting uh, part of this job came up. I told Dr. Frank that I was gonna mention his name. Just about the time we were, all the steel was in, on the site. He was doing some research out balconies, I guess, and it was, Kind of giving us some preliminary results and saying, hey, the it looks like some weathering steel has very slippery mill scale on it. And, uh, the mill scale on this bridge, on these uh, members, was fairly significant, a lot of black mill scale. Ultimately, it was going to be sanded off anyway for the appearance sake, but that all the designs for the bolted connections were done for, for, for slip critical connections, we used to call them. We call them back then friction connections. I think um, were designed without any without any blasting being considered. So the coefficient of friction that was assumed was perhaps unconservative. So a field change was put in place, and uh, the work kind of halted for a while. And while they got to work sandblasting all the thing surfaces for all the different pieces, it's complicated. Uh, uh, you know. The segments were heavy enough that they, and I remember there were multiple segments for these arches, of course, they could not assemble two of them together on the ground and, and get it placed with the cranes that they had and, and the, just the logistics of the, the whole site. So what they did was they had a large 250 ton crane on, on land and another one out on the barge. So here they are putting the first segment trying to go out towards that first tower. The crane on the barge was about to pick the second segment right there. Before that, I got this picture of this three inch diameter bolt that was went through the webs to go into that pin to, to basically, it's just there for erection only to keep the, keep the arch down on the pin while they're, they're yanking on it and whatnot. So here's the, here's the second crane mating up the second piece to the first. So, 
there's this, there's the blasted fang surfaces. That's the uh, one unique aspect of this. There's there's the arch bridge has got you've seen it. There's hanging cables of all the floor beams out there, but there are, there's a floor beam at each end of the arch that is sort of integral with the with the arch ribs themselves. That's the that's the spot where it's going to land. They got one on the first. Uh, they got one side up, and they started doing the same thing on the second side. Just a shot of some of the material that had been trucked in from Houston. They had to remember they shipped all the, or they built it all in South Korea. They shipped it around to the port of Houston and trucked it up here and laid it all out down here. Fortunately, the right of way was very wide. They had a lot of storage room for all the pieces. So here they are making up that, we called it a type A floor beam that was the integral with the ribs. They, Mentioned that there was a big, pair, a big X bracing that was underneath the, the deck itself at the at the bottom of the arch. This is some of the pieces that were going in for that. Swinging it into place. I'm missing something important here. And here it is uh, on the on the south side, fully assembled. These uh, these false work towers had obviously they had rams, hydraulic rams that were installed. So that they could easily shape the arch and, and get it just to the right elevation that the erection sequence required. I like this picture because they another technique that was I thought was interesting. They took an old piece of uh, crane boom and modified it with this big framework that they had on the end and put hydraulic jacks on it because they were concerned that as they bolted the the two ribs together that they would start drifting in too close to each other or move too far apart. So this thing is the sort, sort, I hit that again. This thing was the strut that they could use to keep the, the ribs at the proper distance apart. If, the drift, if they got further apart, they had big old, big winches that they could pull the thing back together with. It's just a, an alignment tool. I was continually amazed at the, how innovative they were. And how I, I, you know, I was out there on this site the whole time and uh, got the, I was fortunate to be asked to go out and help look, help uh, actually inspect the construction. And uh, just to, these plates are extremely heavy. And there's another plate just like this on the inside of this arch. So there's somebody in there helping him. And so they simply use come along to, to bring these two plates together that along with some spud ridges. They got them all aligned and were able to bolt them up. I apologize for my voice, by the way. I've got some allergies going on here. Just another picture of them bringing in the big flange splice coming in. We had, there was a lot of controversy at the beginning on how we were going to inspect the bolts or, you know, how, what kind of technique were, were, were we going to require the contractor to follow. In fact, a lot of the textile specifications came out after this bridge based on some things that went on. It, we, were, we were using the turn of the nut method. And you can see paint all over those, all over those bolts. We we had paint marks put on every one to measure the rotations. They were fussing because they said you guys are tightening these things too tight. <laughs> you know? But we had real. These were big splices, huge, and you know, 11 feet deep. And and we had a system figured out to keep the forces equally distributed on the whole area. The arch is so tall; it's about 170 feet. Uh, at the crest off the ground and they, they quickly found out that all this these big bolts these big one inch bolts that we were making them tighten too tight according to them they, they didn't have enough air pressure left and so this I, this, this uh, again this is a picture show to kind of tell you how big bridges get built they had to put a supplemental air tanks you know at various elevations as they go because of the losses due to that due to the elevation change Another just to me a great picture. Now they're coming off of the of the, of the uh, short tower, heading towards it, one of the tall towers. There we go. Tall towers in place. Same old procedures going on. All that all that was taking place on the south side. The north side I mentioned earlier that we couldn't get a crane on top to reach down and and handle the first piece. But they still had the same issue. They had. Two, they needed to have two cranes 
mating up the things in air to land on that first false bent. How are they going to do it? So here the barge crane held the the, the, the uh, first segment. And then this, now this is just another picture of the completed thing. I got this a little bit out of order, I apologize. But what they did was they fashioned this block and tackle system, pretty interesting. And uh, they built a, they, they then transferred the load to this tie back, if you will, on the, that you see on the right hand side of the screen. And then that same crane that had set the first piece could then pick the second piece up off the barge to, to get it to made up. This, this is an old motor crane that they brought in and you can see right behind him a big pile of rock. What they did was they, that shiv system was actually running back to, to a pit that was dug and a, a dead man anchor was, uh, was fashioned from some cables wrapped around a steel agar that was buried below the ground and they stacked up all this rock on top of it to, to be the a hold back for that. And then this, this, this uh, vehicle here was used just for its winch. You know, it's, it, had a, it had an adequate winch to move that thing to keep it in line. So here we go up, I'd sort of, this is one of my pictures I just like to show all the different crane booms up in the air, including that little strut jib that was going across. And I think there's three or four cranes and all the steel is now resting on, from the south side, resting on the tall tower. All right, this is the other part of the story that I like to tell. We were, one day we, we got about to somewhere about this point, maybe the other rib was installed on the, uh, on the arch that's further away in the picture. And the area engineer came down to meet us for lunch. And we were up in the, in our construction shack eating lunch. He walked in, he says, and he's rubbing his shin and said, boys, he says, I know you know what you're doing. But something doesn't look right about those arches out there. And he says, his name was Orville Miller. He was a great man. I, I really liked working for him. He said, Orville, there's, well, everything's fine. Everything's been going great. He says, it just doesn't look right to me. Said, well, let's go out and look at it, you know. So we looked at it. And uh, he and Chief Inspector Buddy Johnson looked at it and said, something's wrong. You're right. We could see, we could see that the arches were, appeared to be out of line. So uh, well, we hustled down and got the survey. We had all the surveying equipment and everything else. We did all the surveying on the job. Text I did at that in those days. So I set up the instrument and we took a shot and we sent somebody up to the top of this. And oh my goodness, the arch ribs had swung to the west over two feet, those tips of those arches there. What? And I went back and I started pencil. I said, there's got to be some thermal effect or something, I hope. I hope we didn't build them crooked as we started going. You know, we had this, we had the strut and the and the and the winches and everything keeping them together, but maybe they just maybe we got them out of line, you know. That's always the fear, you know, it's a, almost like an Aggie joke. Excuse my Aggie friends, I'm, I, and I'm an Aggie fan too. You know, it's like where the roadways, the two bridges miss each other. Anyway, I didn't get much sleep that night and uh, theorized that the, the sun was causing a problem. Anyway. This is going north and south. The sun would come up in the east, shine on the on the uh, outside of the eleven foot deep ribs, and they had a thermal, you know, radiant across the. With the and the I'm sorry, and um, sure enough, it would cause them to swing. So it, I was out there long before dawn. The next morning, we had the crew out there, and we set up the instruments. We got real solid you know, set up, we, we felt strong that we had the right alignment. We looked up there, we sent him up and he put the tattletale out and guess what? They had, they're right back on the money. So we so up to go tell the contractor what we'd found. Actually, he knew what we'd found the day before. And he says, well, I guess there's only one thing we can do. He says, we'll have to close them at the dawn, you know, before it can, before it can waver too much. Here they were, they came out. This is just a picture of them coming out, getting ready to make the final closure piece as well as the strut that goes in between them. 
they closed one side at dawn one day, and I think it was two days later. They they started working on the second one. And they really had no issues with them fitting up. It was also we also had the benefit of the fact it was kind of cloudy. In fact, it was very cloudy, if I recall. I was up on top of the mountain taking these pictures out there over on the north side. That's just a picture of me because I just wanted to get in there. Oh, I said, I want to see you have to put one picture of you in there. Anyway, they've got the American flag on top showing they're topping out, you know, some some fabricate steel erectors use little trees or shrubs and some use American flags. Another somewhat innovative idea was we were worried about if it was up on false work, what were we going to do when they, we lowered the false work? We're going to get a lot of locked in erection stresses. So we conceived of the idea of a third hinge up at the crest with a three hinge system is statically determinate. It would prevent, hopefully, or at least greatly lessen the possibility of locked in stresses. Um, the hinge plates on one side, if you notice, had no bolt holes on it on the, on the main member. And then they simply had the idea we could simply use a splash paint as a template. And once we got the pulse work down from underneath it, we could uh, field drill the holes in the side. It's just a picture of the little hinge plate down at the bottom. The false work was uh, lowered, hydraulic jacks were lowered, the survey equipment was set up on top of the mountain and the arch ribs were determined to be within a half an inch of their plan elevation. Next step was to hang the, the strands. Um, these were large, two, there's four strands at each location, two and a quarter inch uh, high strength bridge cables, uh, the breaking strength, 301 tons per strand. Uh, the connection uh, to the arch rib was a galvanized clevis uh, hanging off the a plate coming out of the bottom of the rib. And uh, they had the large, uh, what was it, 4.75 inch stainless steel pins. The contractor said, here's what I want to do. Um, he got uh, some big coolers out there. He filled them full of dry ice and whatever, before we went up, all the pins, in fact, they were in there the night before. He froze the pins to make them shrink down a little bit so they could eat more easily be put into the into the holes that had been fabricated for them. And it turns out he needed to. <laughs> and you know they had to be they had they had to be forced in there pretty well. You know, almost every one of them had to had to have a little extra force. The connection uh, to the floor beams themselves were galvanized uh, block sockets with uh, with uh, stainless steel shims. And all the all the strands were swedged into these sockets with molten zinc. Common, it's a common type of uh, cable support, you know, system. We go hanging. We started uh, at the same time. They started putting the steel girders on the uh, at the beginning of the arch span. Started hanging floor beams and and. Uh, stringers and and bracing deck bracing uh here's a, just a shot of the completed steel uh girder system uh here the guys are they're actually working on welding the uh, uh diaphragms at mid span for each one of those 49 foot spans we, we had concern about tensioning these this four cable unit uh, once all the structural steel was up, we, we decided it would be a two-part process. And then again, after the bridge deck, because as those floor beams tried to rotate and deflect at the center, that was gonna create an unequal force in the cables. So this was during the design phase, we, we figured this out. So we uh, the bottom sockets were tapped and a hole was placed in the bottom flange of the floor beam. So these rods could be run through and we could put hydraulic jacks on them. And these, you can see those stainless steel shims. There's, there's more shims there than are left in place. That's just a way of, of dealing with it to get the get everything lined up with the nuts. Also, uh, there was a lot of talk about vibration in cables on arch bridges. So we devised this, actually boss, my boss, Bob Reed, came up with this, uh, this method here of a uh, trying to introduce a dampening system that was, this was a 
add on after the after the job was lit. Another shot of the whole deck. This is a shot of the north span approach girder being set. This is I just put this in here because it was interesting again. Problem with the, the, the steep bank and we couldn't the crane could not get that port you know that type four girder out there. It's too heavy for it. So they sent, you can't see it in the picture very well. It's the only thing, picture I have of it though. They sent a small pair of wide plane beams out as a carrier beam and then they rolled it out onto that thing and then rolled it over to its final position one after another. 1984, the bridge was awarded the Excellence in Highway Design from FHWA. In 1992, the Austin members of the uh, council of engineer, uh, excuse me, the Austin members of the Consulting Engineers Council of Texas gave it an award for the most innovative example of Austin architecture. Most people have heard of, uh, heard that the bridge was named after Percy Pennybacker. It turns out that uh, shortly after the bridge opened, a good friend of the, Penny, of the Pennybacker family, who was a senior executive at the Tracor Corporation, went to the city council and told him the story about Mr. Pennybacker. He was a, a welding expert from the interstate era. He, he learned, to, he taught the whole country a whole lot about, you know, welding techniques and repairs. And sure enough, the city council, it took them about one day to, to grant his request and they named the bridge, Percy Pennybacker Bridge. Bridge was dedicated on uh, November 29th. The uh, Clearwater Constructors was the general contractors, and they're now Hensel Phelps. Kenny Drilling did the foundations. Bristol Steel out of Bristol, Virginia, with the steel erectors, which was kind of unusual for us to bring a, an, an erector from out of state. And uh, the bridge, let's just talk about the art span itself, is $9.4 million. I don't know if you could build it for that today or not. I'd go out on a limb and say, not even close. It turns out the bridge is a great backdrop for the PGA, the Dale Match Play tournaments held out there every year. The first couple of years, I would get phone calls. David, did you know the bridge is on, on TV? <laughs> you know, gotta watch for four days. It's, if you watch the tournament, about every third shot was you know, a picture of somebody hitting to that screen here with that arch bridge in the background. It's also a great backdrop for a photograph of my two favorite people or two of my favorite people, my two granddaughters. Thank you.